I know it's a little warm in here, but now I've told you, I've been warning you for weeks about this air conditioner system. Some of y'all think I turned it off just so you'll finalize the offering today of what we needed, right? <laughs> if I'd have thought of it, I might have, but I know that when we uh, first started the church, some of the first chairs that we brought in the church were metal chairs. And uh, somebody said, well, we need to raise some money for some cushion chairs. I said, not yet. Let them sit in those metal chairs for one year and we'll have no problem raising money for cushion chairs. Sure enough, you guys are just so benevolent when it comes to yourselves. <laughs> In fact, I think we're only a few thousand dollars short of the funds. They're already working on it. Uh, if you get mad about it, talk to Robert where he's all to blame. So <laughs> they're out there getting the measurements all done, getting the units all ordered, and everything's getting ready to be put in place. Hopefully this week we'll get some going, and it'll be a little cooler. I told you when you start getting this 98-degree weather, the two units are out, you start noticing it a little bit more. But uh, praise the Lord, amen? amen? We'll get through it. Hey, there's people in, uh, when I go to Central America, we don't have air conditioning there. Most of the churches I preach at when I'm in Eastern Europe don't have air conditioning there. So uh, I'm used to it. <laughs> Y'all smile a little bit, amen? It's Father's Day. <laughs> praise the Lord, it's a good day, it's a great day, and I love summertime, I like the heat personally. I'm not one of these cold weather guys like some of you guys are. Somebody says, Pastor Ellis used to ask, you want to go skiing with me? He said, is it water skiing <laughs> or snow skiing? You can keep the snow skiing, amen. I'm the kind of guy, if I'm going to go to the <coughs> ski resort, I'm going to be sitting inside with the hot cocoa by the fireplace watching you guys outside. But uh, praise the Lord, in all things we just give thanks. Good to see you today, though. We're, we're in our series of messages on the miracles of Jesus. And as we've gone through these miracles, we've been pointing out specific things. One, remember the word always means sign. It translates literally sign in the New Testament. Many modern translations, instead of saying a miracle, that he did miracles, it says he did signs. Because that's really what they were. They were, they were literal signs that, one, pointed out to the fact that, you know, the Messiah had come. This is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, but he's also the Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. He's, he's God in the flesh, and he's come to save us from our sins. So all these miracles uh, do that specifically, but they also, there's a message in the context for us today. And they're laid out in very unique places as, as Jesus goes through his ministry. We talked about the last couple of weeks how the miracle of the, of the feeding of the thousands, a uh, week before last about the feeding of the 5,000, and the following week of the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, these are miracles now that we're getting towards the end of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he's here in person. And he's working, uh, uh, you know, mostly the focus is upon his disciples, even though, yes, there's things that are happening. But the religious crowd has pretty much rejected him. And many people have quit following him, too, because of the hard sayings about discipleship that he had spoken them about. So uh, there's still a lot of people that are coming by the thousands. In fact, uh, last one of the feeding of the 5,000, remember, they wanted to take him and make him the king at that point. There, there was still some of that category. So, but as you get to this part of the miracles, this is a, a miracle today we're talking about, which I think is the 13th that we're doing in our series called Dad's Demons and Deliverance. Uh, it, was, it uniquely falls on this day, which is Father's Day. And we see the story of a father in this miracle who comes to bring his son. So it just, you know, isn't it amazing how the Lord works all these things out? Praise the Lord. But uh, in, in Mark chapter 9, it's recorded in Mark and Matthew, uh, you see this story about this father who brings his son, first of all, to the disciples. And remember, the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. And then the father brings him to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this, we see the story of this, this father. And since it is Father's Day, I would like to focus in on this particular dad and, and see some things about him. And hopefully, if you're here today as a dad, grandfather, great-grandfather, whatever it might be, that there'll be a message here for you as well that'll encourage you and, uh, you know, help you be a stronger father in your relationship because this is a unique father when you look at this particular miracle. Let's look at Mark chapter 9, and there's about seven verses that we want to look at. It says, they brought the boy to him, to Jesus, and when Jesus saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground. He began rolling around and foaming at the mouth, and he asked his father, uh, I, I, Jesus is asking, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus uh, said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. 
And when Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out, throwing him into convulsions, terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. So here's this great deliverance, this great miracle of deliverance from this demon this boy's been possessed by. We don't have his age, but obviously it's, it's been a, a long time that he's been uh, harassed by this, this demonic spirit. But again, there's about four, five, or six things maybe about this father I, I want to look at first of all today. And the first thing I want us to look at is, is the compassion. Uh, here was a dad who's obviously broken for his child. He's crying out, you know, you know I have pity. He I brought you my son. So here's a father who's obviously moved by compassion. We don't know, again, just how old this child is. But as you read the story, Jesus is even asking him, you know, about, about the length. He said since he's a baby, since he's a child, basically a very young child is what the idea here is. I don't know how many years have gone by, but he's saying if you can do anything, please have pity. Have compassion on us. Here's a dad who's got a son who's in a very bad situation. It looks like uh, what well, we would just look at probably not knowing about the demonic spirit would say it's a physical malady of epilepsy. It's very similar to, to that. Uh, the frightening words here when Jesus says, how long has he been this way? Again, from a, a, a little child. Now, it's a bad deal. I mean, you see the description of it. I mean, it made the boy mute when it would seize him. He'd throw him in convulsions, slam him to the ground. He'd foam at the mouth, grinding his teeth. Uh, he stiffened out. Uh, like Matthew records, they would throw him into the fire. When he got near water, they'd throw him into the water. And so th the child is, is in bad straits. So obviously, here's a father who's broken for his son. He has a, his heart is bleeding for this child who's been having to endure this affliction most all of his life. And so here's a dad who's genuinely concerned about the, the, the terrible situation that his own child is in. So he's, he's, he's moving forward out of love and out of compassion. It's kind of at this point, you know, whatever it takes, that, that's what I'll do. Matthew 17, the King James records it like this. My son is a lunatic. You know, I've read that before and thought that about my son. <laughs> you know, as fathers, you understand what I'm talking about at those different times. Especially when he got to those teenage years, I was sure he was a lunatic, but he, he, he got over it. In fact, the word here in the King James that says lunatic is pretty good at, uh, 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 a translation for what it's saying here. It, it comes from the word lunar. In fact, they would say the word would be more translated, he's moonstruck. Uh, you always hear about people in the ER business, you know, in the ambulance business and the emergency room business who say, you know, on the full moon, you know, crazy things happen. The idea was, uh, at least, remember, he's in a Gentile part of the country. There's a lot of Gentiles that are coming to Jesus at this point. So there's a lot of idolatry. But they believed that somebody with this condition had been cursed by the moon gods for whatever reasons, you know, they had offended the moon gods. And they would call them, in this situation, they would call them moonstruck. And then they're under the curse of this, this, this particular moon god. And uh, in fact, they say that the, the seizures are these, this... Uh, uh, episodes that they would experience being thrown in the fire or whatever would occur during certain moon phases. So the idea was given to that. Uh, but apparently this father has a little more uh, understanding of that. He realizes that his son, he says, my son is possessed by spirit, whether it's been given to him by the moon or whatever. He's not sure, but he understands there's a, there's a case here and there's a malady here that's far greater than anybody can help him with. And who knows, probably he's gone to great lengths to, to find some kind of resolution to resolve the son's uh, infirmity that he has, but he's found no solution. But he's coming to the right source now, and he comes to the Lord Jesus. And he's coming, again, because he cares. And a father who cares, you know, then there, you're going to be followed up by some commitment. He, he's not just going to say, I love my son. He's going to help his son. He's not going to just say, I care about my family. He's going to do something to be involved and to show his compassion. In other words, if there is genuine compassion, it is always followed up by genuine commitment. And it's not just a short-term commitment, but he hadn't just dealt with this for a little while. Remember, he gets back to that, that issue where he says, it's been this way since, since he's, a, since he's a, a child. He's had this malady, he's had this, this problem. So he's got this big issue. And he loves his son so much that he hasn't given up since he was a child. He stayed true to him. He's looked for answers. 
He sought to help him. He sought to, to find some resolution or some, some solution for his son's problem. So here he is, and he's committed to the problem. He's looking for some kind of answer to help him in his problem that he had. He hadn't given up. He hadn't settled in. A lot of times people get the attitude, well, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, just kind of, they resign to the problem. It's kind of, well, at the, if there's no hope, I'll just cope. All right? But that's not where he is. He, he hears of somebody who might be able to help. He's not saying, well, there's no help. I've tried other stuff before. This is not working out. And I think about this when I think about the woman who, who had the issue of blood that we preached on uh, that, you know, said that uh, she had suffered much at the hands of many physicians. I would, I would think that this father had probably done the same thing, had gone to a lot of, a lot of uh, resources looking for some answers to the problem that he's in. But there hadn't been any. But he's still committed. He's not giving up. He's sticking with it. He doesn't bail out. Now, we're living in a culture many times that's exactly what a lot of dads will do. They bail out. He doesn't bail out. He stays with it, which brings him to the decisions that he makes. In fact, he makes the wisest choice that you can make at all. He makes a decision to take him to Jesus. He probably has no idea just how good a decision this is until he gets there and meets the Lord of glory, but this is the best decision. In fact, please understand, anytime you make a decision to turn to the Lord for answers, that is not weakness, that's wisdom. Amen. And some people kind of look at this issue, and sometimes especially in regards to men, that turning to Christ, turning to the Lord, turning to the Bibles might be some kind of sign of weakness. I had friends like that who, when I gave my life to the Lord, you know, kind of thought that was, that, that was a choice of weakness. It's kind of like, well, one guy told me this, one of my friends, and found out what kind of friend he was. He said, well, I guess if you're a cripple, you need crutches. That was his mindset of Christianity. And that was his mindset of the Lord. And if you're a cripple, I told him, I'm not crippled. I'm just dead. I need a resurrection, all right? I need life. I don't need crutches. I need, I need wholeness and help. But the idea, but that, a lot of people hold that mindset, don't they? That there's something there that it's, it's for, you know, that... That church stuff and that gospel stuff and that God stuff, you know, that's, that's for weak people and people who need, you know, if, you, if you're lost and need a road map, I guess the Bible's as good as any, yada, 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 all right? Uh, that's not weakness. In fact, he brings him to the greatest source of help in all the cosmos, in all the universe. He brings him to, to Christ. And, and if you have a big problem, it's better to find a bigger answer. And this guy has a big problem, and so he finds the biggest answer. He brings him to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is, you'll see in the situation, is in all of these situations, he is the dominant Christ. He is the Lord of glory. There's nothing bigger than him. There's no greater amount than him. There's no greater authority than him. Hey, Jesus is the man's man. He's the answer to every, solution, to, to every problem. He's the solution. He's the Lord of glory. So understand, and that's, that's worth praising the Lord over, Amen. So as, as you think of that and you think about where he's bringing, think about your own situations as well, whether you're men or women in this room today. You have a problem. It's not weakness to turn to the Lord. All right. And it's not, it shouldn't be done just as kind of the last ditch effort. I guess I'll try God. No, that's the answer. And if there seems to be some kind of desperation you're feeling in your life, God's given you a little help to find out that he's the answer. So take the hint. Listen to what heaven's doing. If you feel a little push from God to the cross, be pushed, amen. Let the Holy Spirit pull and lead and guide. He's not going to make you, but certainly God will bring some inter to introduce some situations in your life that will give you a little bit of clue. Hey, the Lord is the answer. The Lord's the answer. You say, well, this is a big problem. It's not too big a problem. He's the Lord of life. He's the healer. He's the redeemer. He's the restorer. He's stronger than what the Bible calls the, the strong man, which is, which is the, the Bible calls the devil in one case the strong man. But Jesus is able to bind the strong man and able to show his authority and his grace and his glory, as with all these miracles. His power is overwhelming in this situation. So you look at this father's decision to bring him to Jesus. This is the smartest thing this man's ever done. And let me say that to you. No matter what the situation is, no matter what the problem might be, no matter what the issues are, no matter what the sin might be, Jesus is bigger still than all these things. 
He's larger than all these things, and he's the ultimate overcomer. So he makes this decision. Uh, I guess I'll take him to Jesus. That's the only answer. And he takes him to Jesus. Well, first of all, he takes the disciples, and they couldn't do anything. This kind of gives you a little bit of insight into the Father's commitment. You know? Uh, can I speak to your supervisor? <laughs> He moves beyond the first row. You know, it, 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 he just it doesn't stop with the disciples. And the disciples are over here arguing with the scribes about why they couldn't kick, kick the demon out, all right? So while they're involved in their religious debate, Jesus gets on the scene and he deals directly with the answer. And, and, and let me tell you, by the way, sometimes there's a tendency to run to spiritual people when we have problems and issues. There's, there's nothing wrong. The Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counselors, right? It's, it's all right to get answers, right? but your answer is not going to be found in the preacher. Your answer is not going to be found in some spiritual leader. Your answer is found in the Lord. All right. And if a true preacher is a true preacher and a true spiritual leader is a true spiritual leader, he'll point you to Jesus because that's where the real answers are. And so here's the Lord. He gets on the scene and, and he starts dealing now with Jesus. The father does. And here's his cry. Have pity on us. New American Standard, ESV, I believe, says, it says, have compassion on us, please. I mean, this, there's, there's a, there is, a, there is a, uh, a kind of an echo here, a sound of, of, uh, of desperation. We, we don't have any answers. We don't have any answers. Can you show compassion on us? He's shown compassion on the multitudes. Maybe his father's witnessed some of these healings. Maybe he's witnessed some of these deliverances. We don't know, but he comes to the Lord and, you know, he, ha he, he comes with the right, Lord, please have mercy on us. And listen, fathers, there are some situations in your family and with your children or even with your spouse that you will be introduced into in life because life can be hard, you know. The, your answer is always going to be found in the Lord that you can go to him. And, and, and he's, not, he's not a God who has favorites. The Bible talks about this, you know, this, that we're all his children. You know, and he hadn't got favorite kids. That he's merciful to all of us. He's compassionate to all of us. You say, well, he did it for, you know, for Pastor Strickland. I don't know if he'll do it for me. <laughs> he loves you. He has compassion on you. He knows your need, but he's, and he's waiting for you to make that kind of bold, courageous decision to really go to him with the crisis. To really take your problems to him. And, and this is where we see in, in this parable, he's making an appeal to Jesus who's there. But understand, he's here as well. We have this relationship based on faith with Christ. We have him personally in our life. You say, yeah, but he had him right there. The Bible says we are more blessed when we believe and we haven't seen. So I believe we have a platform of grace for us as the children of God that's just as great or greater than what he had. And I think we need to take the opportunity that God gives us to, to make the appeals. In other words, if we're going to be a, a great father and you want to be a great dad, then you're going to have to be a praying dad. Not just a religious dad. A dad who goes to church or maybe takes the kids to church, but you yourself, you have this personal relationship with Christ whereby you have, a, you have ground you stand on with the Father that you know him personally, you can appeal to him personally, and you know because of your relationship with him that he hears you. And you can go to those times where it gets severe at times and say, have pity on us. And I love the way he puts it. He didn't say have pity on me. And that's where a lot of people fail, I think. They, they have a problem child, perhaps, or a problem situation. And they go to God and they say, oh, have pity on me. <laughs> you know, and it's really not about the child and it's not about the family. It's about your personal hassle. Now, I kind of talked about this Wednesday night with our, in our series on Jonah that, you know, it's got to get out beyond you. It's got to, you know, because... It's really not about you ultimately, it's about God. And it's about the people he's put in your life around you for you to be a, a, a tremendous and powerful influence upon. And one of the greatest influences can be that of a father. And as a father, you realize, hey, it's not me, it's us. You know, and if you're hurting, I'm hurting. There's not a one of you dads that, 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 that have an ounce of, of, of dadness in you, all right? That when your kids are hurting, you're, you're, you're hurting too, aren't you? And how many times has you, you've seen your spouse endure something, you've said, God, if there's any way to take that offer and put it on me, put, do it, all right? 
That's, that's, that should be a man who's genuinely involved. That, that's his heart, all right? That, that, that's a dad's real heart. God, if there's any way I can take this off my child or take this off my, you know, it, get it beyond them. Give it to me. I'll take it. I'll endure it. Let me handle it. And I think that's true with every father. But what I'm saying is that, hey, as a father, you can go to Christ just as this father did. And you can make your appeals to him. And it is, it is something that he is concerned about. At the same time, as a man, and you who are men in this room, I think that you know that there's something about every man that when a problem does arise, we think we can fix it ourselves, right? And after we break it a couple more times and have to call the plumber <laughs> or whoever it might be, because we can fix this, and you make little jokes and laughs about that, I know that if I attempt plumbing at my house, I might as well get ready. I'm going to make at least three or four trips to Lowe's or whatever it might be, to the hardware store. Because I think I can fix it, but you know how that goes sometimes. But, but how, how true that is when it relates to our spiritual life, isn't it? We think that we can fix this or we can do this. You can't raise a family without Christ. You can't be a husband without Christ. You're not going to be a man without God. God never intended you to live your life without him to start with. And you, you've heard me say it before, a man without God is just a hunk of warm meat walking around. You know? We need God in our life. And God created us to have God in our life, to have a walk with him. And he recreates us when we give our life to Jesus. Sin does his, his pitiful work in us. But when we come to Christ, he remakes us. We're rebirthed. And now we have him in our life. But now we ought to exercise that relationship. We need to call on him. We need to pray to him. We need to involve him. We don't need to fix it ourselves first. It's like when all else fails, and I'll pray. No, well, pff, hey, let's reverse that. Before all else fails, let's pray. Amen. Let's make the first step the Lord Jesus. So he's not ashamed and he's not embarrassed. They have mercy, have compassion, have pity on us. So he turns and he does the right thing. He makes his decision and he turns to Christ. And when he gets to Christ, you know, he's crying out to him. Catch, catch the candor of the moment, and the honesty of the moment. When the Lord says, you know, as he tells him, you know, my son's often casting the fire into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. If you can do anything, and I love what Jesus says, if you can. Now, if that were us, and we were accomplished in somebody, in some regard, and somebody said, if you can do this, we say, what do you mean if I can? But there's no arrogance with Jesus here. Please understand that, all right? He's not the arrogant Christ. He's the humble, approachable, loving God in the flesh, all right? And the idea here is, a, in other words, you've brought him to the source. There's no problem here with that. I, I can do what I'm supposed to do. You, got, you came to the right place. But will you believe? Because if you can believe, all things are possible. Amen. Right? In other words, you've plugged into the right outlet. Will you turn the switch on? <laughs> will you believe me? Will you trust me? In other words, God, God is fully able to do everything in Scripture, he tells us. But now we've come this, this, to this place where we personally will trust him to do it and we'll personally believe him and we'll personally embrace him. It's all about a personal relationship with him. It's not like some foreign outside thing here. I hope God can do something. No, he can do something. All right. God can do what you don't think many times he can do. He can do. There's no mountain too tall, no ocean too, too deep. We, we, we know all those things. In fact, he uses a little bit later, he talks about mountains and moving mountains, and he just says here, but all things are possible if you believe. Now, you've come to the right place, but here's the candor of the Father. I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> I believe, but I don't even know if I can believe enough. I don't know if my believing's right even. I, I, I don't, do I know what believe means? You ever get that kind of situation? And, and he's, he's honest enough to, to say something. Calvin, Calvin wrote this about that. He said, he declares, the man declares he, he, can, he believes, but yet he, he acknowledges himself to have unbelief. These two statements may seem to or appear to contradict each other, but there's none of us that doesn't experience both of them in himself at different times. I want to believe. Help my unbelief. I really want to see you move here, God. Help my unbelief. 
And that, I think that's the kind of hu humility. I think that's the kind of candor or honesty or whatever you want to call it that honors the Lord in a way that says, you know, without me you can do nothing. Jesus said that, remember? That I get the point of you saying, I want to see this fixed. I want to see this restored. But if you don't do it, I, I think there's things, that, that there's times that come in our life when, when we, we know what God wants. You have been in this place where you know what God wants, but you don't necessarily want it. Anybody ever been there? At one time, perhaps, maybe all of us. God's trying to tell you to start something, stop something, do something, go something, but you don't necessarily want it. You know, you just say, I, I don't know. I, I know what the Lord wants, but I'm not sure if I want that. And this is where the grace and the glory of God comes. If we can take that one step, say, Lord, so help my unbelief. I think it's the old prayer. I remember Mickey, Mickey Bonner, as evangelist years ago, you say something like this, that we need to pray that God would do in us what needs to be done in us so he can do through us what he wants to do. And I think this is where this man is, is you know, help my unbelief. You know, if, there, if, if I'm falling short here, if I'm not where I need to be here, then I need you to work in me. I need, by the way, God still does do work in people's hearts. Yeah. And God can still change your heart. And you can find and discover that that which you didn't think you wanted, you're, you'd love. Amen. That's your greatest, God can so work in you, that becomes your greatest desire. If we can come to this place of just humility and honesty and this kind of openness to God, say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Do in me whatever you need to do so you can do it through me and in this situation, whatever you desire to do. And boy, I think if we get honest with God and start getting honest with God like this, it'll revolutionize our life, our walk, our prayer, everything. You know, that, this was kind of where I was when I first gave my life to Jesus. You know, I, I looked at some really on fire Christians and I, I saw them. I said, well, I, 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 I want to know Christ, but I can't, I, I can't do that. That's, that's not me. And I found out when I fully gave my heart to the Lord, uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> I want to live for Jesus. I wanted, to be, I wanted to serve God. I, I, wanted what, I wanted to think. Yeah, there's this contradiction in my flesh. All the time we have that, amen. But there's some greater desire in us called the Holy Spirit's presence in us, Jesus alive in us. That, you know, it's like one guy told me, he says, well, you don't want to. Well, he'll change your want to's. Amen. And that's the power of God in the life of the believer. And this man kind of uncaps it all of a sudden. And the Lord said, you know, if you'll believe Everything on my end is no problem. What about your side? In fact, Jesus told the disciples a little later they couldn't cast the demon out. Kind of got back to all this. And they said, well, why couldn't we cast it out? He says, because you wouldn't believe the littleness of your faith. All right. And he says, you know, and then he goes on talking to them about the size of the mustard seed. And I thought, you know, he just talked about the littleness of their faith that couldn't come out. And then he says, if you just had the faith of a mustard seed, you ever seen a mustard seed? It's almost, you know, it's just a speck. You think, but how little was their faith? If that, all, all the faith is needed is just the size of a mustard seed, they really didn't have much faith at all. You know, they really didn't have much faith at all. And Jesus said, and then he went on to explain that this kind of comes out by prayer. In other words, I believe you have to be in tune with God is what he's saying. Because when we spend time with God, we, we start being a little more in tune with God. The less time you spend in prayer in your life, the, the less in tune you are with God through your day. Do you know that? You understand what I'm saying? But the more you'll spend time with the Lord, the more you spend time in the Word of God, the more time you spend time with the Lord, uh, the more acute, the more aware, the more sensitive you become to spiritual things in your life. And they were not. Jesus was the one who's always taking time to go spend time with the Father and give you alone with the Father. So here they come, and here's the, here's the story. Now, this, this, what Jesus is saying here, remember, in the context, he's not saying, just walk out to any one of the, the mountains in the Black Mountains or, you know, the Ozarks, any, just go pick a mountain range and just say, get up and be cast in the sea. And the mountain will get up and be moved to the sea. People have been trying that for years, hadn't worked yet. Not without a dozer. <laughs> right? He's not talking about mountains. He's talking about obstacles. And he's talking about this specific obstacle, this demonic spirit that was influencing this young man's life. He said, you speak to that mountain in faith and, and cast it in the sea, and it'll be cast to the sea. What did Jesus do when the demon came to him? He didn't speak to the boy, he didn't speak to the father. He said, hey, come out of him, deaf and dumb spirit, and don't return. And that was the answer. Just speak to the problem. Speak to the issue. Speak to the problem. 
You know, there's a, you know, this, this particular miracle has so many layers that we could get into on spiritual authority and you know, uh, ministry of demons and how they work. But the, the, the bottom line here is, here's a man who comes and wants to believe. I want to believe. And his heart wants to believe. He wants to be what God wants to be. He wants to see God move in his, his son's life. It's not about him, really. It's about his son. And God does a miracle here. At the same time, Jesus is teaching a lesson to the disciples that they, they need to quit riding on his coattail and spend time with God themselves. So when these issues come in, they learn the lesson because you follow their ministries later on. Amen. They learn the lessons. That they had the authority, they just needed to act on it. They needed to act on it in faith so that when I say it, I believe God's moving. I believe God's working. So when you get into this, this story here and you see what God does in this life, I think there's, there, there's some this simple thing here is that, hey, he, he, find, he got to the right source and he cried out for help and he was humble in his request and because of it, he saw an answer. He got rewarded. His son was healed. After crying out and, and throwing the terrible convulsion, the demon came out. The boy became like a corpse. Everybody thought he's dead. Jesus takes him by the hand, raises him up and he gets up. He gets up and he presented back to his father. Now, what a moment. There, were the, there was a guy, King, Canon Guy King, wrote, the, wrote this little statement that kind of makes it a neat little outline that says, the boy was mad, the father was sad, the devil was mad, the crowd was glad. <laughs> kind of puts it all down in a nutshell. But if the father's especially glad. The son's especially glad. No more convulsions. No more demonic activity. Nothing, there's grace. There's peace. There's joy. There's satisfaction. Two things really are emphasized, and we'll wrap it up with this. One is the power of faith is important here. Not intellectual believing and just kind of sending things, but really saying, you know, I trust God so much, I'll step out. I'll trust God so much, I'll speak to this situation. I trust God so much, I'll witness to that individual. I trust God so much, I'll rebuke the devil from my family. Satan, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And I believe that God's moving when I say it. It's not great faith, Jesus says. It's just, it's just walking in that faith. Size of a mustard seed. Mountains can be moved if you believe. These objects that get in our life and get in our way can be dealt with through prayer and faith and trust in our Heavenly Father. But we have to pray and we have to trust and we have to believe. So that brings us to the second point, which is the necessity of prayer. We have not because we ask not. If you want to be a great dad, be a praying dad. You want to fail as a father, stop praying. You want to succeed in life, genuinely succeed, then pray. There's no other answer. There's no shortcut. And so many times, that discipline of prayer in our life, that discipline of, of praying and spending time with God, is probably the most forsaken discipline. It's probably the least done until we get in crisis. I would encourage you, through this, that you catch this simple lesson, especially as fathers. Be a praying father. Learn to spend time with God. Learn to pray over your family. Learn to pray over your own life. Learn to pray for your friends, your brothers, your sisters in Christ. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your nation. Pray and believe. See what God does in your life. Be a praying dad. So you see, in the context, you see, this context of dads and demons and deliverance is the mighty God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can think or ask. But we have to ask. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning?